Hi, Natasha and hi, Nicole. We're just uh, gathering people back in the room. I can see that you can see the room. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. We'll get back into the natural capital conversations, and we're, this afternoon we've got a panel session for the next 35 minutes on local financial institutions and financing natural capital. We're very lucky to be joined both in person and online by experts in this area. Uh, joining us in person, please um, welcome us uh, Alana Barrett. She's the Associate Director of Agribusiness Research for ANZ and um, she joins us in person. Meanwhile, online, we have uh, Nicole Yazbek-Martin. She's the Head of Taxonomy and Natural Capital for the Australian Sustainable Finance Institute. Uh, Nicole, if you can give us a wave so everyone knows you're in the white shirt. And Natasha Greenwood, who's also joining us online, she's the General Manager for Agribusiness at Commonwealth Bank. And uh, if you could give us a, a wave, fantastic. I'll join you on the panel, Alana, and um, we can get started. On or not on? Oh, there we go. Fantastic. So we'll do a, a quick tech check. Um, Nicole, uh, I'd love to hear uh, from you your background uh, in a minute. All right. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's um, lovely to join you all virtually. Um, so I head up the work program at the Australian Sustainable Finance Institute, working in a partnership with the Australian government, developing a sustainable finance taxonomy, which really, um, in essence, is just a classification system which uh, classifies economic activities across the economy, including agriculture, um, to um, um, and classifies them according to their sustainability attributes. And the, and the purpose and drive behind developing a taxonomy is to ensure that we're all talking uh, more or less about the same things and concepts as we, as we seek to channel more private capital into um, sustainable outcomes, including natural capital. Um, I also uh, work very closely on our natural capital work program and as part of that work, and I believe you will be um, talking with Sue Ogilvie later this afternoon, we work in, in partnership with Farming for the Future to really look, I guess, at the bottom end, which is um, how good natural capital practices lead to productive and resilient outcomes. Um, for um, obviously for for the farming community, and then really the the, the value that that also helps to create um, for financiers, banks, and investors, so that, that they can structure their products and services um, accordingly to to really um, promote and work in partnership with farmers to drive those outcomes. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nicole. The sound's really good in the room. We can hear you well, um, and welcome, Natasha. We'd love to hear your background as well. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and it is terrific to be able to join you today. Um, I'm dialing in from Adelaide, but you never have to twist my arm too far to have a conversation about natural capital and, and, and the opportunities in transition. Um, I've been with CBA for over 30 years now. Um, my role within CBA today is to head up the agribusiness um, portfolio and to create and execute on our agribusiness strategy so that we've got the tools, the products, the services, as well as the capabilities to be really able to support our customers um, in their ambitions and goals for their farming enterprises. And of course, today, a lot of that looks like um, the transition to lower carbon, rebuilding natural landscapes and um, working with producers so that they can maximise the opportunities as we move towards lower carbon and nature positive, um, but that we also manage those risks. So delighted to be with you all today, and I know you'll have lots of questions and hopefully we can um, share some really valuable insights. Thanks so much, Natasha. And over to you, Alana. You're the Associate Director of Agribusiness Research at ANZ. Um, yes, Tell whatever us. that means, Jill. Um, so I work across the national agri portfolio, but I'm actually based here in Wagga. So I haven't travelled too far today, but um, my husband and I farm down at Mangapla, south of Wagga, and uh, I work um, for ANZ in a capacity that I'm looking at industry issues that affect our portfolio nationally and I'm um, sort of absorbing that information, 
reporting back both through our internal structures to our executives and our board, but also to the market. So um, I do a bit of work with the media around commodities and price movements and that type of thing as well. So a bit of a um, jack of all trades, master of none, but I will um, see how I go on today's panel. Alana, let's start with an overall view of natural capital and how the finance sector is involved. How are they engaging in sustainable land and natural resource management by farmers? And I think it's really interesting coming from you because you're local, you're here, but you're also in a very senior role with the bank. So um, please do share with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thanks, Jill. So I think um, if we consider the way that banks are involved with farmers in the way that we lend money, you could say that we've been financing natural capital and sustainable agriculture for the entire time that we've been financing farming. And for most Australian banks, that's nearly you know, a couple of hundred years now. And why I say that in some context to that is that as a banker in a really privileged position, and so all of these agribusiness managers, no matter what colour shirt they wear, are driving around Australia, going onto farms and getting a physical look at the way that you, you as a farmer manages your natural capital. So they're looking at the way you manage your land, your water, your plants, your animals, uh, your people, your infrastructure. They're getting a view of all of this and they're taking that on board. Then they're coupling that with your financial performance, both historical and looking forward. They're sometimes getting a view into your business over a 30 or 40 or longer year period for customers that have been around for that long. So it's a certainly a position of privilege. And what we anecdotally in banking have learnt is that there is a clear link between responsible natural resource management, natural capital management, the way you manage all of those things I've just mentioned, and your long-term viability, profitability, um, sustainability, and that's a really broad word, I don't like to use it too much. So, I think you can consider that banks already understand quite well a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about natural capital management but and already consider them. And we consider them then uh, as, I guess, measuring how risky lending money to your business is perceived to be. And so in a way, good natural capital management is already incentivised through the risk profile of your business as you present yourself to your bank. But we're moving now, I think, and we'll flesh this out, I'm sure, through this session, to a phase where all of these environmental credentials and all the things we've talked about so far today are becoming more formalised. Uh, they're becoming more marketable and more real in a way that banks can now start to get involved in incentivising and speeding up that transition and helping you on that, on that journey. So I think what I'm hearing is when you see a landholder coming to you with ways to increase their natural capital in ways that they wish to improve their land holding, you're looking at them as a, a good customer. I think it just all forms part of, yeah, the overall view of you as a, a farmer and the more information uh, that you can present to your bank around the way that you farm, the better off you're going to be in that relationship. And Natasha, I can see you nodding along in agreement. Um, how, how do you see the industry evolving? Well, look, I think firstly, if I, if I start with a few first principles, that, that might be helpful for everybody there. So um, we see the transition to lower carbon and nature positive as presenting enormous opportunities for agriculture um, and opportunities for um, producers to be able to optimise both productivity, profitability and demonstrate their sustainability credentials. And so the conversation that we have with many of our customers is around how do we make sure that we're supporting our customers extract both economic value as well as positive environmental outcomes. Um, so the work that we do focuses very much on um, working with producers to optimise the opportunities and to manage the risks to demonstrate the economic value as well as the environmental value. I think the second first principle um, or the second principle that we really operate under is understanding that every producer is starting from a different point in time, that every producer will have different capacity as well as different capability to be able to undertake transitional farming activities 
and that when we talk about the transition to net zero or the transition to nature positive we we tend to talk in aggregate. so we're talking about the portfolio or we're talking about the sector recognising that each individual farm will have different opportunities and and different activities that they can undertake to transition. um our role as a bank is really to to support producers in whatever their goals are on their farm because they'll they'll all be different um but very much around ensuring that we've got a very comprehensive suite of um green financing solutions to incentivise those producers that are ready to make that investment in farm practices that have um environmental outcomes so that might be either reducing emissions avoiding emissions or rebuilding natural landscapes and working with producers around services that can actually help them get started so um i can talk a little bit about that later today as well and natasha are there any trends or drivers you're seeing internationally or or nationally that you think might change the finance sector look certainly and i know nicole will talk a little bit about this as well but um we're definitely starting to see mobilization um by supply chain um by banks um by industry by producers and of course by consumers as well so i used to talk about saying that the conversation was um shifting i now talk about saying that it, the conversation is accelerated and the conversation has shifted so we're finding that many of our customers today um have a very good understanding of why transition to lower carbon and transition to nature positive is important they're now actually more interested in what does that mean for me um how do i get started and what might be some steps that i could take for my farm um but certainly we're seeing supply chain wanting to collaborate with banks and with industry to make sure that we're simplifying things for producers so that producers aren't going to be asked to do something for banks that's different to their supply chain that's different for their industry um and we're starting to see all of these things come together and obviously underpinned by the work that federal state and local governments are doing as well so i know nicole might add to that but but certainly i i really talk about it now it's it's mobilization phase i can see nicole nodding along along here nicole mm -hmm. you're in a role with the australian sustainable finance institute what trends or drivers are you seeing internationally or nationally uh that may change how the finance sector incentivizes um sustainable land and natural resource management what are you seeing yeah so i mean i absolutely agree with everything natasha said and i think it's it, we were actually in that phase of now doing the hard yards of making it happen and really i guess what are the what it, what the what are the supporting architectural pieces from a from a from a financial policy point of view that will really help to accelerate that that capital in a way that like Natasha says does not have adverse outcomes that's done efficiently where everybody is joined up and we were all kind of pushing in the same direction so the key drivers i think is a is a really strong recognition not only obviously that we we need to get a handle and start to drive down our emissions as 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 a globe because if not we are going to be living in a world thank you difficult Nicole. for us to farm and do everything but also that nature is an important part of that so that so that interconnection the two sides of the coin as people like to talk about it both from a risk perspective but an opportunity perspective are now deeply embedded in financial thinking and now it's a matter of how we make that happen and so part of the work that we're doing around is is supporting financial institutions supporting others along the supply chain making sure that we're all coordinated to be uh what are the important things that we all care about what are the key pieces of underpinning um i guess uh, uh reporting and structures that we need to put in place to ensure that we're doing things in a robust way that we're doing things transparently but that it also works on the ground and we're actually driving real world outcomes and so things like taxonomies and disclosures and and all the things that we're collectively trying to do we need to ensure that they actually deliver on those outcomes and channel capital to where we want to get it to Thank you Nicole and I'll just let the audience know we have 20 minutes um remaining of this panel session and we are happy to take questions from you. Um a question for Natasha and Alana perhaps to you first Alana. 
What's an example of a, a time you've recently assisted a landholder to navigate yeah, financing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jill. So not me personally, but um, lots of examples um, through ANZ's partnership with KEFIC, it's the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, where we finance the upgrade... <clears throat> excuse me, the upgrade of on-farm um, equipment and infrastructure uh, to more energy efficient, lower emission, um, diesel to solar, things like that, that are simple, structured, um, easily achievable targets to both measure and um, structure into finance um, over time. And so diesel pumps, um, on a big irrigation system recently, uh, a simple transition to solar. So it doesn't have to be complex and difficult. We can access green finance for traditional things like financing a tractor. And what does green financing mean? Is it a percent lower? Is it cheaper to, faster to True, obtain? True, yeah, that's a very good point. Thanks, Jill. So when we're talking about green finance, and we do have to be really careful about the way that we use that term because the banks um, and, and anyone in the industry has to um, measure up to that and be able to prove that what we're calling green is actually green, otherwise there are some very serious um, ramifications. Um, so in this case, yeah, we're talking about a, a quite significant discount of, of half a percent of the interest rate on, on the amount. I, I noticed that the Port of Newcastle that trades coal got a higher interest rate for their uh, loans because they're dealing in coal, but it was like 2% higher. Do you think you and Natasha could go 2% lower? <laughs> <laughs> Tricky, Jill. <laughs> Natasha? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think certainly the opportunity is to incentivise producers. So we very much want to um, demonstrate, firstly, our commitment to a successful, thriving, dynamic ag sector, and then to create the framework so that producers actually want to invest in these activities. So I think um, certainly, Alana, you've, you've highlighted a really good example there in relation to um, renewables. Um, but we're certainly seeing um, customers interested in activities that might be around soil rehydration, uh, might be around precision application of chemicals or um, precision irrigation, um, the tree plantings, it might be around um, energy usage such as renewables, might be around um, remediating or soil erosion activities, all of those sorts of things. So we were very proud to bring to Australia, Australia's first agri-green loan, which is specifically designed to assist farmers finance those activities and activities that either avoid or reduce emissions on farm um, have the ability to qualify for an agri-green loan and there is a material discount. So um, depending on the amount borrowed and the, the overall risk profile, but, but certainly it's at a substantial discount to what we would normally provide so that it helps manage the economic cost of investing in those activities. Um, a really good example is a customer of ours in Queensland, very large land holding, um, over 90,000 hectares in Queensland, wanted to implement activities that would help with soil rehydration, very low rainfall area. So they installed spreader banks to slow the flow of water across the property and to be able to harvest more rainfall. They also did a one-off compaction um, arrangement to assist with rainfall harvest across the property and they implemented rotational grazing with multi-species pasture cover to rebuild soil health. Um, in addition to that, they were able to register a soil carbon project. So we, we were able to finance all of those activities via an agri-green loan um, to support that farm. And what we've been able to do since then is um, not just have the agri-green loan available to support the capital expenditure that's required for those activities, but the next question that we get from customers is quite often, so how do I know which activities I should undertake on my farm and that suit my business? And so we really talk that the very first step in that is, is measurement, is baseline measurement. So understand the economics of your farm, understand where your baseline is, and then think about how you might model or consider which abatement options are relevant for your business. So... In um, February and March this year, we undertook a pilot program with um, emissions measurement platform Ruminati, and many of you in the room might be familiar with Ruminati. They're actually a Riverina-based um, organisation, Bobby Miller, um, from your neck of the woods, 
developed um, Ruminati and we gave 50 of our customers the opportunity to use the Ruminati pl Prime platform to be able to firstly measure their own baseline. Um, secondly, though, then to model those abatement options which they may want to consider on their farm. So the most um, popular abatement options that were modelled by our pilot customers were pasture management um, opportunities and also herd or livestock management opportunities. So, so specifically, what would happen to my emissions profile if I um, applied yet less, less, less urea, less lime, less super? Um, what might happen if I adjusted my stocking rates or what might happen if I implemented multi-species pasture cover or, um, or a rotational grazing. And so this is what's really moving um, customers or, or producers to shift from being deeply curious um, but somewhat confused towards intending to do something because they understand more, towards actually being able or feeling empowered to take action because they've got the information and they've got the finance that they need. And Natasha, they're such great examples of how um, customers are using specific financial products. Um, Alana, before I throw to you and ask what sort of products you're seeing people using, and Nicole as well, if you're seeing products that people are using. Uh, Natasha, we had a question come in through Menti. Uh, will clients who don't know their emissions or their baseline be charged higher interest rates in the future? Yeah, look, it's a really good question because this is this level of curiosity and concern, you know. What is my supply chain going to expect? What is my bank going to expect? You know, when people talk about transition, how's that going to impact me in my business? That's a great question, so thank you. And, you know, our position at CBA is uh, going back to we think there are enormous opportunities. Um, we want to support producers with those opportunities, but we recognise every farm will be different. So we want to make sure that each farm has the information that they need or each of our customers has the information that they need and we want to support them with their own goals. So for each farm that will be different. Um, we're very much operating on we want to incentivise producers to think about the activities that they may undertake and we recognise that food security is a really important aspect here. Um, the reason I'm so you know passionate about talking about natural capital and, and lower carbon is because Ag is at the pointy end of solving or contributing to three really complex global problems. You know, how do we grow more to feed a feed and clothe a growing global population? You know, how do we emit less and sequester more carbon? And how do we rebuild natural landscapes? So we're very much on supporting producers to do mm -hmm. that, not penalising them. Absolutely, Alana. What are you seeing in the way of these products rolling out in this area? Uh, I'll just firstly just, yeah, I think Mira, what Natasha, <coughs> excuse me, has said around the bank's role there to incentivise and encourage that transition um, as opposed to, to penalise or enforce or even prescribe, <coughs> excuse me, getting over a cold, uh, prescribe. So I think it's actually really pleasing when we get all of the banks together in a room on this that everyone is actually very aligned in their view, um, which is, I think, just good for everyone to know because there is that level of underlying concern. In terms of products, yes, yeah, so, so what I've mentioned in terms of our partnership with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, um, also a product which we call a sustainable sustainability linked loan. We like the government have lots of acronyms, SLL. And that's where we're linking specific environmental outcomes on farm um, to, you know, it's something which has to be reported and checked off to say, yes, we did achieve that outcome at X period of time. And that comes with um, a varying discount depending on what exactly that activity is, the level of finance, the level of risk, all of that as well. And are there any questions in the room? I know Kate's got, we've got two here. We might get the microphones over to you. Um, while we wait for that, I've got a question here. We heard earlier that getting bank approval to do a carbon project on a property with a mortgage was a challenge. Uh, banks looking to remove some of these practical constraints, yes. Alana? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one, Jill. I think we've been on a journey with industry with all of this, and so um, the concept of, okay, you're an eligible, uh, you're, an, you're an interest holder in this mm -hmm. land, we have a mortgage, um, can you just approve this so we can get on with it? It all sounds so simple. In a big organisation like Australia's big banks, these things take time and we're on a journey. Uh, but I think, and I would hope that you would find that at least all the big banks have really gotten their skates on with most of that process side of things now. 
and it's certainly been an area of focus to make sure that we're not hindering because we certainly don't want to be in a position of, of slowing progress through our own red tape. And just another question that's coming in, what are, what, at what scale are these loans? Is it mainly larger farms that are investing? Are, are they scaled down That's products? a great question because often a lot of the work that you're doing on farm uh, to enhance your natural capital is incremental. It's little bits over time. You're planting trees this year, you uh, change to a perennial pasture system next, you're fencing out a riparian zone the next. Often they're not material amounts of money that you would need to go and seek a particular um, green finance product for. And that's where I go back to where we started, which is we need to make sure and um, where you can um, help yourself in that situation is making sure your bank understands all of that that you are doing on farm. Um, the more data you can capture to prove that benefit um, through the help of everyone that we've heard from so far today, the better off that conversation with will be with the bank who can then understand what you're doing on farm and how that's lowering your risk and your chances of um, success into the future. Thanks, Alana. Over to the floor, we have a question up front. Uh, thanks. Um, look, I guess the bank saw the, the impact of um, when water licences were decoupled from property and how, um, you know, if, when a water licence was sold by a property owner, how dramatically that devalued the property. I'm just wondering if you've got any concerns about um, farmers selling off their carbon to a third party and how that'll impact the value of their property. Yeah, I can pick that one up if you like. Go for it, Natasha. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's another really good question. Um, I mean, carbon, we, we could have a one hour conversation just about carbon. It's um, a really complex area. I think firstly, again, if we sort of start with first principles, um, we recognise that farmers have a choice and that farm, some char farmers will choose to inset, so they'll choose to keep their own carbon credits for the purposes of demonstrating their own sustainability credentials. Other producers will um, choose to offset and diversify their income by selling their carbon credits, and some producers will choose to do both. They will inset first and then they will offset um, once they've been able to achieve a position where they've got surplus credits. Um, the carbon market in Australia is probably one of the um, higher integrity carbon markets globally. We've got a very good regulator in the clean energy regulator. Um, we've also got excellent um, resources available and some very, very, very well thought through methodologies. Um, today, we have the ability to be able to finance um, carbon projects either through traditional forms of finance like the agri-green loan which I was talking about earlier but we're also exploring new ways to be able to finance carbon projects and last year we um, financed our first carbon pre-finance transaction so this was for a cattle station in WA where they wanted to use the future value of their Australian carbon credits to actually finance the carbon project itself and we financed up to 50% of the future value of the carbon credits. So I think from our investment in that sort of transaction, you can see the confidence that we have in the carbon market and the important role that it's going to play in Australia's transition and the important role that producers will play on the supply side of, of that transition. Um, the other aspect around carbon that you asked was around valuations. So today there are accredited valuers that can um, confidently produce to your bank a valuation that's both as is and also with a carbon project. Um, and there are some fairly clear guidelines around standards for that. I think all of the banks are evolving their thinking around how they will treat that in the future um, and what lending margins they will apply to um, properties that have got carbon credits attached. Um, but um, I think, you know, hopefully you've heard through uh, this session today that you know, we're really moving towards supporting producers who want to engage in carbon projects and to provide the incentives that we can to, to make that possible, both through finance, but also in the way that we actually treat the valuations and, and, and treat the, the projects themselves, as Thanks. well as the carbon credits. Thanks to Natasha. Um, we've got a question up the front here. We've got about eight minutes left on this panel. So up until that last question, the financing that had been spoken about was mostly about like really tangible outcomes. Um, and yeah, a bit like that. I was just wondering about like the bank's appetite to fund things, uh, not so much in the carbon side, but the biodiversity side where 
to enter into these BSA agreements, um, there's actually like huge upfront costs, but that would obviously be quite a risk to the bank. Um, yeah, there's, there's no guarantee at the end, but yeah, what's the bank's uh, appetite, I guess, for, you know, lending uh, money for things like that? Yeah, I can take and that does click. it fit under green yeah. finance? Um, I think we need to just, I guess, take a step back and remember that we have a responsibility to you as the customer to make sure that we don't finance you into something that is not financially viable. You know, we've all been through the Royal Commission and everything that that uncovered. And so we do have a responsibility to make sure that we are comfortable with whatever it is that is being proposed, whether that's a biodiversity project, whether that's buying the farm next door, um, whatever that may be. So sometimes when there's these unknown outcomes, it can be tricky because it's really grey. But that's where I asked the question earlier this morning of the panel um, who was up here around, is there help available to farmers to work out that balance between what are the upfront costs of going into a, a particular project or, or scheme? What's that going to do to my revenue and productivity? And getting all of that information together so that, one, that they understand it and can make an informed decision, but two, so that we can understand that as well. So it's really, again, going to come down to the data that you can present and the information and the story um, that makes that a safe investment for you and for your bank. Um, because at the end of the day, as I said, no one wants to set a business up into something that, um, that doesn't work. Any other questions from the floor? I can see Lisa. Yeah, just to follow up, the security, I guess, of the finance that you're offering, like you've got your sustainable linked loans. Um, Natasha, you spoke about the carbon project in WA. That obviously is a longer term one. Like, is it all related to the length of time that loan is? And um, I assume the green finance is more equipment loan too. So I just wanted to know how you handle that security and what that security is. Is it the, the land or, yeah? Yeah, look, if I, what we're really trying to design with um, our suite of sustainable financing options is to meet a range of different needs. So in relation to the agri-green loan, I describe that as being really well suited to a producer who wants to undertake capex on farm for a new activity that's going to lower or avoid emissions. Um, that's, that's structured really as a standard, you know, if you think about it, similar to a standard term loan, um, but with, with the discount applied um, to incentivise the, the, um, the sustainable activity or sustaining farming practice. The equipment finance would really be for the purchase of plant and equipment that has an eligible um, or that is eligible un under that um, criteria. So usually there's a green component to, to that plant and equipment. So whether it's a sprayer, whether it's a tractor, you know, whatever it is, there would be an eligibility component there. But that is linked, from a security point of view, that is linked to that plant and equipment. For the agri-green loan, it would normally be linked to the farm property. Where it's a carbon project and people don't want to link it to either, so they want to be able to um, rest on the um, value of the future carbon credits, that's where we might consider a pre-finance of carbon credits to be able to do that because that's not linked to either the farm farm property or the or, or the assets of the farm other than the GSI, which is the, the the assets of the business, the general security interest. Thanks for that question, Lisa. Um, as we just look for questions in the room, I'll just ask um, Nicole, uh, is there anything that you've heard that you would like to add to or, or make a contribution to? No, I mean, I think it's been really great to um, sit in here, um, you know, practically on the ground, how uh, some of the things that we're working on at the systems level really translate through to um, enhancing the, the suite of sustainable finance products that we can offer. And like um, Natasha said, giving people the choice to be able to pick these things and making it easy to actually shift that, that management practice. I think the one thing that I would just confirm and reiterate around... Um, you know, banks really seeking to come together collectively as, at a systems level to really kind of drive those incentives and outcomes um, is, you know, in the work that we're doing on the on the natural capital um, advisory group that we hold, we have, you know, CBAs on there, ANZs on there, actually all of Australia's major agri-lenders are on there. We're meeting every two months to kind of really deep dive into what natural capital means, how it drives profitability and resilience outcomes, 
all with the purpose of being able to increase that understanding and um, be able to provide those products and services. So I, d I do really think that you know this is this is a case where where people really all see the mutual benefit and are, and, are, and are really trying to drive that in the right way. Nicole, one of the questions that came in is, it says profit margins are tight with the rising cost of production in many agricultural enterprises. How can we strike the balance between allowing farmers to capture meaningful information rather than just the compliance data? Is that something yeah, that they could bring to your organisation? I, this, is, this is the crux of what we're really trying to do, both in terms of the Natural Capital Advisory uh, Committee program of work, is what are the key things that we care about that we actually need to know that's both in the interests of the banks and the finance sector from a risk and opportunity perspective that are also in the interests of the farmer from a productivity, resilience and opportunity perspective, so that to what and to what extent is the information that can and, and the farmer will be collecting is also in his or her benefits themselves because it drives production on the ground. Um, can we ensure that that is done in a way that is consistent? And then let's who else is in the value ch chain that is also going to be asking for that information? That let's ensure that we're asking for it in the same way. So we want to create that efficiency in terms of reporting and information, so that it's not a compliance burden, but it's actually a production outcome. Um, it actually has a production outcome effect on it as well. And then this is where the link between emissions reduction and increase in things like soil carbon, to the extent that it has a productivity um, uh, driver, you know, the farmer should be collecting that for their own management actions. How can we make it simple that they're collecting that, that that's also reported up and in what format would that be? But then I do think if there is uh, the regulatory system does demand things over and above that, then I think there is an equity question around who should be paying, like who is the beneficiary of that and who should be paying and how that should be spread. And I think this is where absolutely um, engaging with government and regulators and everyone along the supply chain to, to ensure that that burden is shared equity, equitably is, is something, is an ongoing conversation, I think something that we, we need to continue to raise and have that, that discussion. Okay. We've reached time. Um, Nicole, this is a quick question. Noting that agriculture has been named as a priority sector for development of the taxonomy, but not in, is not in the first three under development, how far off do you think it is? Uh, that was a great plug. Um, our EROIs went out yesterday, so that's our expression of interest for people to join our technical advisory groups uh, to be part of helping to shape the criteria for the taxonomy for the agricultural sector. So if you haven't seen that, please jump onto ASFI's website um, or any of the social media things, and we really encourage uh, you know, pe people from a diverse range of backgrounds and skills to apply to those advisory groups to help shape the criteria. We will be getting started with that in June. So um, really Fantastic. looking forward to starting to engage in that part of the project. And Natasha Alana, 30 second closing comment. Uh, for anyone who's listening today and if we've piqued your interest about um, either activities that could be undertaken, how do we get involved in measurement, how can the banks actually help me, um, speak to your local banker. Um, we genuinely want to support producers successfully transition to lower carbon and nature positive and there's a range of ways we can do that beyond just the products. Um, so talk to us about what you're interested in. There's nothing that you could ask me that I have not heard around regional Australia in the last 12 months, and I'd love to have the opportunity to chat to you about it, as would your local bankers. Fantastic. Thanks, Natasha. Alana? Oh, look, I um, agree with what Natasha just said, but also, um, yeah, hopefully we've, just, we've taken some of the concern out of it a little bit today, and you can understand that we are all on a journey here together, and we're working really closely with industry um, and farmers and customers and people like Nicole to make sure this isn't an overly burden, sort of, you know, a, a big burden coming at farming because nobody wants that. We don't want that. Um, so yeah, hopefully rest assured that that's something's come from today. Fantastic. I deeply love my bank and I speak to my bank manager at least every week, if not every fortnight. And I, I cannot stress the importance of having early and ongoing conversations with your bank about things you are too afraid to ask just to put them on the table. It has been an absolute privilege to have um, both Natasha, Nicole and Alana um, in the room with us to have this panel session. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your expertise that you bring. 
And um, please put your hands together for our panellists. And...